Welcome back, everyone that is online. We are glad that you are joining us at whatever time you're watching this uh, broadcast. We, uh, we're just having a great time in the Lord. In fact, I want you to hear the people that are here. If you're here and you're enjoying yourself, put your hands together and give the Lord a praise offering. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My, my, this is a good a good, good crowd. I've been praying and praying and praying about what the Lord wanted me to speak. I actually had another message. And then we had the Voice of the Martyrs Conference and it just blew me away. And I couldn't stop thinking uh, about what I heard and what I saw that evening. Uh, if you were here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I felt... I felt so ashamed for every time I complain about any kind of hardship I've been having after I heard what other brothers have gone through and are going through. In fact, one of the things that, that, that was said toward the end and it was said several times is remember to pray for our persecuted brothers. There's, there's brothers and sisters, there's children, there's adults, there's people of all ages that are suffering for their faith. They're being persecuted. They're, they're losing their, their possessions, losing their friends and family. They're uh, uh, being beaten and losing their freedom. And some of them are being killed. A lot of them are being massacred and killed. And, and it is horrible the way some of them are killed. Others are thrown in prison and tortured for years. In pastors, uh, deacons, people of the church. And, and you know what? We forget about that sometimes. But may we never forget. Remember to pray. One of the messages was, if you pray for us at the church, we will feel your prayers. Pray that God give us strength and God give us hope. That was the message I heard at this conference. And it was powerful to uplift them up in prayer. And uh, uh, the message that I have today is part, partly uh, inspired by that conference. And bringing it to our time and our place as a country here in America. I want you to hear me very closely as a pastor, as your pastor. I, I am very careful what I say from the pulpit. I try my very best to not be divisive, to not be cantankerous or try to stir up any trouble. Uh, but sometimes God speaks to our heart as pastors and as leaders. And he gives us a message. And no matter how much we try to avoid it, God doesn't let us. He keeps bringing us back. And, and, then, and then the Holy Spirit begins to convict us when we see the courage and hear the courage of men, persecuted Christians, and, and, and we lack courage to even speak the word of God that he gives us. So this morning, with the help of God, I want to communicate clearly what's on my heart. And, uh, and I never target anybody. I always try. In fact, I tell people that I preach to myself first. Uh, and, and then you can listen in and get what God wants you to have. But I believe that all of God's word is for all of God's people. If you believe that, say amen. amen. So it is not my intent this morning to be over dramatic, an alarmist, or even political. I understand that there's different political views in almost every church. However, as your pastor and God's servant, I feel a duty. And an obligation before God to make you aware and prepare you for serious issues that will affect us as individual believers and as a church. We talked about persecution and sometimes we always think of persecution as somewhere far away. And we feel sorry for those people and we pray for them if we even remember. But we don't realize what is slowly coming to America. Some of these uh, changes, serious issues, are already in process of becoming law. The present administration and Congress are bringing changes that will affect and impact the church and the country in a ne negative, frightening, and very concerning ways. 
We cannot continue business as usual without waking up and getting involved in preserving our religious liberty and, the, and our way of life as we have known it. I just finished reading a book by Cal Thomas. It's called America's Expiration Date. Boy, it left me, it left me thinking. All the world empires that the world has seen has come and gone. And the average age of all the world empires, some of them more, some of them less, but the average age is 250 years. And then they disappear, they fall apart, and they're no more. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be transparent and, and admit my own faults. I have gotten so used to what we have in America, our freedoms and the privileges that we have, that I've thought this is going to last forever. It's been around a long time, so it's going to last forever until I read that book. Do you know that I, I think we're just a few short years away from 250 years as a country? America, I'm going to make a statement. And it's so true and it's so biblical, but even your pastor doesn't think about it. America, as we know it, is not going to last forever. Whether it be by it crumbling and falling or by Jesus Christ coming. Read the book of Revelation. This country, as we know it, is not going to last forever. We cannot continue business as usual. It's time to wake up. I believe that our faith, our convictions and practices are about to be put to the test. Are we ready? That's a big question. And that's why I want to speak to you this morning about. Because we know the danger of the times and we anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ. We should be all the more energetic and committed to a right walk with God. Instead of a sleep walk with God. Romans chapter 13 verse 11 the Apostle Paul says do this knowing that the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep. For now salvation or some versions say our salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. What a warning. What a warning. I want to title a two-part message that I will preach the first part, part one today, and part two next Sunday, the church and America in our time. The church and America in our time. And part one is while you were sleeping. And part two is wake up and get going. We'll cover that next week. But this week, while you were sleeping, while we were sleeping. How important it is to awake out of sleep. We can do many things and essentially be asleep towards God. Did you hear what I just said? We can do many things and essentially be asleep toward God. How can that be, Brother Pete? You've heard of people that sleepwalk. I've heard of people that sleep talk. I haven't heard of anyone that sleep preaches yet. <laughs> I hope I never become one of those. <laughs> what a difference it makes when we are awake. Awake we can speak, we can walk, we can hear, we can sing intelligently. Last Friday we hosted this conference on persecution of Christians in countries hostile toward people of faith. Much of the church, and when I say church I mean believers worldwide, in the Western world is not prepared for, a, for the arrival of difficult days that will challenge what we believe, 
with more serious consequences than we've seen in our time and in our country. I remember a time, and to me it seems like not too long ago, but I realize when I look in the mirror that it was a long time ago, maybe. I'm, I'm about to turn, turn 65 years old. You know you're getting older when your kids are getting way taller than you, but you know you're really getting old when the girls are getting taller than you. I got a hug last time by, uh, by uh, Alyssa Martinez, and she was taller than me. Destiny is catching up with me. I know I'm getting old. But I remember a time when there was a respect for God and for church. When your religious convictions were even enough to get you out of military service if they were sincerely held. They called it a conscientious objector. Where you didn't have, were not forced to do things that violated your conscience because your religious faith was sacred and it was respected. Whether you were a Muslim, whether you were an, a, a Christian, whether you were a, a Jehovah's Witness, whatever it was, your faith was respected and it wasn't touched. I'm here to tell you that those times are going to be changing pretty soon. Totalitarianism, I don't know if you ever heard that word. It comes from a word that means totalitarian. And it's a rel relatively new word that barely started about the beginning of the 20th century. The old word before that was used was called tyranny. It's relating to a system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete service to the state. There are no individual rights. Totalitarianism is the practice of this type of government. China is a prime example of this. The government tells you what you can do, what you can say, and even what you can think. We are now living in a time, and I can't believe how quickly it's changing, where experts and politicians know and decide what is good for you and for me and for our country. And we're treated like we don't know good enough, so we have to be told what to do. The New York Times bestselling author Rod Dwyer of the Benedict Option draws on the wisdom of Christian survivors of the Soviet Union persecution to warn Americans of approaching dangers. I just ordered this book. I can hardly wait to get it. It's called Live Not by Lies, a Manual for Christian Dissidents. The title sounds scary, that last part. You know, have you heard the word dissidents? The word dissidents means those that are like rebels that are against the government. And they're a threat to the government. And sometimes dissidents are arrested and imprisoned. They're persecuted for their, their beliefs. And to hear this title, a manual for Christian dissident, makes me think and remember we're fast approaching a very different time in our country. For years, immigrants from the Soviet Union bloc have been telling this author, Rob Dwyer, they see telltale signs of soft totalitarianism cropping up in America. These are people that came from Russia, that came from China, that came from Iran, that came from countries where totalitarianism is the system of government. And the word comes from totality, which means the government controls everything, every part of the life of the country. And people that come from those countries say we are beginning to see soft 
totalitarianism cropping up in America. Something like the book, The Brave New World. You know what? I hadn't even heard of these books, much less the movies. They got a movie on this, and they made it, revised it three times. The latest one is 2020. The other one is 1984 by George Wells. These are known as sci-fi thrillers, but actually, more accurately, they're prophetic novels. They speak of a America that is weird. It is totally different, totally controlled by the state. And in, in the book, 1984 by George Orwell, there are, th this movie was made many years ago when they didn't have the modern technology of today. So they had these old TVs, but they got TV monitors everywhere. They got them in the houses, they got them in the streets, they got them in the businesses, they got them everywhere, and they're observing people. And they can tell even by the expression. They take a, a, a guess what that person is thinking. And there are people that are informers everywhere that are part of the government. You don't know who to trust. Everything is controlled right down to the thought. Did you know that there's places like that in the world already? Where children are taken from their parents. Korea is one prime example, but even China. And they're indoctrinated with communist, not, uh, communist and socialist propaganda and taught that the state is everything and they are to be loyal to the state above anything, including God and even their parents. And that it is an honor to turn your parents in if they say anything against the state. I want to tell you, it's, if you don't know what they're teaching your kids in school, you better find out. You will be shocked. Rewriting history. Teaching morals mean nothing. We're in the time of sexual confusion. We thought it was a challenge to deal with homosexual issues, but now we've got transgenderism. We've got all sorts of problems as a country. The U.S. Census says that there are now more cohabiting couples in America, and it has been this way for a while, than there are married couples. The family is disappearing. Everything is changing. And here we sit as Christians, we believe what the Bible says about the family, what the Bible says about government, and what the Bible says about our personal lives. And yet, it's becoming a challenge to practice it. I heard a government official of the President Administration say, we want to blot out discrimination and we want to do away with the excuse of religion to keep practicing discrimination. I don't know if you've heard, but pastors are starting to do that, so I'm, I'm going to do it myself. Pastor Fernando was the last one, and I, I commended him on his courage. This is called the Equality Act. Thank you, Sister Joni, for bringing this to us. The Equality Act already passed the House. It passed the House, not the Senate. But we really need to pray because this bill is a big, big challenge to the church. No longer will we be able to use our religious beliefs to say I can't perform gay marriages. No longer will we be able to use our religious beliefs to say we can't have same-sex bathrooms. We'll have to change the bathrooms where guys and girls go in the bathrooms. Now, we're a small church in a small town. You might say, uh, what do I got to worry about? If you get enough activists that are looking for churches to make examples out of, they go hunting for churches to challenge them just so they can report them. I never thought I'd see the day. And, and Joni, anyone wants this, you give it to them. Because this will inform you how you can 
get involved in letting your senators know how you feel about this. I already contacted both of them. We are living in challenging times. And this is just one small thing. There's other things coming down the pipeline. Identity politics are beginning to encroach in every aspect of life. If you're white, you've committed a terrible crime for being white. You have privilege. And shame on you if you have anything good or any success. You need to give it away to the poor people. I'm not here to defend rich people or, poor, or, or lift up high people. I'm not on neutral. But someone said something that I remember and it stuck with me. They said if you took all the money away from the rich people and gave it to the poor, in five years, the rich people will get it back. Just because they're ingenious on how they do business and they work hard and they would get it all back. See, it's not a problem of just giving it out. It's a problem. It's, it's a challenge of work. <laughs> it's a challenge of being, in, taking initiative and, 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 and getting yourself up and saying, I'm a child of God. I got a brain. I, I'm not a victim. Uh, I, I am special to God and I have value with God and I can, I can take on challenges and I can do things for God. I did not finish high school. I barely went to my half of my high, second sophomore year of high school. Not because I didn't like school. I love school. I, this is really weird. I was one of those that hated uh, Fridays and loved Mondays. Yeah, that's really weird for a student, huh? That was me. I love school. But we were a family of nine, and my dad, I was right smack in the middle, and my dad said, you got to get out, and you got to work. There's, I need help putting food on the table. And he said, ask for a transfer from California to Arizona. And I said, yes, a transfer to another high school. I got a transfer, all right, from the high school to the fields, and I never got back into school. I could have felt like a victim, I'm going to be a field laborer, a sod buster all my life. No future, no nothing. But you know what? Some people say religion just makes you bigoted and mean. My faith inspired me to say, I'm not going to stay this way. I went and I got my GED. Sure, it wasn't like, you know, a, an exact high school diploma, but it was a GED and I got my GED. And two years later, I went to co a Christian college and I was there four years. I was on the dean's list and I graduated with honors. I look back and I remember sitting in the canal, an uh, irrigation ditch, wondering what my life was going to be like. We don't have to be victims. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Amen. This victim mentality that says you owe me because of this or because of that. And we've been marginalized and pushed aside. The, we can choose to be victims or we can choose to be overcomers. Amen. We live in a country where there's opportunity. And if we work hard. But people don't want to hear that. When we become victims, we don't do anything for ourselves. We just wait for somebody else to feel sorry for us and do it for us. Civil liberties are increasingly seen as a threat to safety. Progressives marginalize conservative Christians traditional Christians and other dissenters. Technology and consumerism hasten the possibility of a corporate surveillance state. What is happening with YouTube and Twitter? They're canceling people left and right. Now you might think they're only ca canceling a certain political group. No. They're canceling Christians too. And the latest victim is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> a cartoon book. Oh, we can't have that. Stifling any other kind of speech that they don't agree with. You know what? I don't agree with the Jehovah's Witness coming to my door and knocking. I don't agree with their doctrine. I don't even like it, to be honest with you. But they have a right to do that in America. Catholics, other religions, they may be wrong, but they have a right to choose what they want to be. This is America. 
And I would never want to say, well, uh, let's just have Christianity and nothing else as tempting as that sounds, because then we wouldn't be America. We wouldn't be a democratic republic. People must have the right to disagree. And we all will not fully agree all the time, but we will, and we can, and we should love, be patient, and pray for one another. And the pandemic, a famous author named Alexander Solzhenitsyn famously said that one of the biggest mistakes people make is assuming totalitarianism can't happen in their country. Many American Christians are making that mistake today. Sleepwalking through the erosion or the falling apart of their freedoms. I remember when gay marriage passed in what was it, 2015, a while back. And they asked, the Supreme Court gave the verdict and it became legal in all 50 states. And they asked the founder, the person that was in charge of, uh, of the LGBT movement, well, do you feel satisfied? You got a victory. And you know what she said? She said, yeah, we got a victory and we're happy, but we still got more work to do. And one of those tasks that we have is we have to get the church on board with this. They asked Rick, Rick Warren about gay marriage. Rick Warren pastor Saddleback Community Church in California, a church of 22,000. And they were hammering him. I believe it was uh, uh, Piers Morgan. And he finally said, Pastor Warren, even some churches are getting on board with this. They're seeing that this is part of America. You can't fight it. If you can't fight it, join it or accept it. What say you? <laughs> I am so glad for the answer he gave Pastor Warren. He said, listen, I had no say so about what was written in the Bible. And as a minister of the gospel, I have no choice of what I preach. I preach everything that the Bible says. If I'm like for it, praise God. And if I'm hated for it, praise God anyways. I said, there's a man of courage. Because we may start being disliked. We may start being villainized and accused falsely as bigoted, hateful, religious fanatics. Michael Wilhite used to work in the county, and I know Brother Wilhite for a long time. He was worship leader for a long time there at Wilcock, at Bisbee, First Assembly. And I had a conversation with him, and I told him, year after year, they take a poll of Christians in America. And that you know that year after year, this sounds like a contradiction. You might say, wait a minute, Pastor. How can all this be happening that you say when you hear the results of this poll. But year after year, they ask people what, if they're, what religion they are or how if do you identify as a Christian. And 70 to 80% of Americans identify as Christians. Now you want to say, woo, woo, we're a Christian nation. We're doing good. But the word Christian is beginning to change. And I told Brother Wilhite, I said, there will never cease to be people that call themselves Christians. Never. And there will always be a majority. What will begin to diminish and you'll see less and less is people that take a stand for the word of God and believe it from cover to cover and will not compromise their convictions. Those are the ones that are going to start disappearing. Jesus says in Matthew, to some that will appear to him on the last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and do many great miracles? Do you know what the Lord will answer them? Depart from me. I never knew your workers of evil. You can't
can't be, say you're a believer of God. I mean, you can't be a believer of God, a true believer of God, and just cave in and say, well, what can we do about it? I had a man come up to me. He said, Pastor, we know your convictions, but it's everywhere. What can you do about it? I go, so is murder. It's everywhere. Are you going to bow your head down and say, what can we do about it? Just let it happen. You want to kill me right now? I can't stop you. You better believe me. I'm going to try to stop you from killing me or killing a loved one. These are the times that we are living in and don't think that it can't happen. It's actually starting. James Coates, and I know people have their opinions, is a pastor of Grace Life Church in Canada, Edmonton. And he's sitting in jail today. He's been there for two weeks, handcuffed, shackled, because he decided it's time to have a, more people in church than he was allowed by the government. His church had seen zero cases. The area where he lived, there was no COVID. They had had one case. I mean, that really come down from what it was. And they came, they warned him, he didn't listen. They came back the second time and they issued a warrant for his arrest. He turned himself in. Courageous pastor. You say it can't happen in America? Canada's our neighbor. They're in stage two of persecuting Christians. In America, in 2015, when gay marriage passed, there was a county clerk in Kentucky. Her name is Kim Davis. You can look it up in Google. Of course, she got smeared by, by big tech. She's a Christian, loves God with all her heart. And the law had just passed, and she refused to put her signature on marriage license of gay marriage. They warned her she wouldn't do it. She said, the, the ruling has just been made, but the state hasn't decided how they're going to address that issue. They said, you will sign or we will have you arrested. A judge told her she wouldn't do it, and they arrested her. Here in Kentucky, Kim Davis spent two weeks in jail. She wouldn't give in. Finally, her staff said, listen, you don't have to sign. We'll just get a rubber stamp with your name on it. You just stay out of the way. You just got to get out of jail, and we'll do it. And they got her out of jail. I can't believe I'm seeing that in America. And that's just one of many cases I could be here all morning telling you. Uh, of, of Jack Phillips, of Baronel Stutzman, of Elaine Photography, and other Christian businesses, even here in Arizona, that are being threatened for their religious convictions. And some of them shut down and some have wound up in the Supreme Court. In the book, which I call a prophetic novel, Aldous Huxley wrote this in 1931. Boy, how prophetic can it be? Brave new world. The main message is that the government retains control by making its citizens so happy and superficially fulfilled that they don't care about their personal freedoms. In the book, the consequences of state control are loss of dignity, morals, values, and emotions. In short, the loss of their humanity. The theme is the incompatibility, things that don't go together, of happiness and truth. Throughout the novel, uh, there is a character, one of the main characters named John the Savage, and he argues that it is better to seek truth even if it involves suffering than to accept an easy life of pleasure and happiness. That was in 1931. Boy, tell me if that isn't prophetic to what we're seeing in our days. That it is better to see truth, even it involves suffering, than to accept an easy life of pleasure and happiness. 
Mark chapter 8, verse 36. Jesus said these sobering words. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose or forfeit his soul? Truth is more important than pleasure and happiness. This is not even a Christian book. It's a novel. But boy, they were right on. God, you may not feel comfortable with what I'm about to say. God is not as interested as much in our happiness as he is in our holiness. Wait a minute, Pastor. I thought there's joy in serving the Lord and victory, and it's gonna be it's gonna be so happy and exciting, and people are gonna look at the change in my life and they're gonna say, Wow, I want some of that, and, and you're gonna be, you know, respected and loved by some, but you're gonna make other people uncomfortable. Because they say it can't be done and you're doing it. Brother Gilbert, I enjoyed the times we traveled together and he told me his testimony where he came from. In this church there are many people, Sister Mercedes, others, many, that you should sit down and talk to them and just ask them their testimony, how they came to the Lord. It's inspiring. It's a blessing. And the world says that can't happen. It's fake. It's just religion. And yet here you are as a result of God coming into your life and transforming you from the inside out. And that makes some people uncomfortable. How many of you remember Gilligan's Island? I just dated myself. Huh? I love that series, Gilligan's Island. The kids are looking like, what? What's that? I know you're looking at me, Titus. What's that? Gilligan? <laughs> I like that movie so much that that show was a show that somebody came out with uh, singing Amazing Grace to the tune of Gilligan's Island. And I, <laughs> and I thought, cool. Of course, I, I like the older version. Yeah, I kid you not. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Done. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. Blind, but now. <laughs> I love Gilgan's Island. In one episode, Gilligan decides that he can fly. He gets some feathers like a bird, big old feathers. Some of you may have seen it. And he, and he jumps off a tree and he's flapping his wing. And he's, guess what? He's flying. And the skipper sees him. And she, he says, Gilligan, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying. He goes, you can't fly. He goes, I can't. He goes, no. He goes, oh, and he goes down. <laughs> and people tell you, you can't be a Christian. You can't live by those biblical convictions. You can't believe everything the Bible says and expect to follow it. That's an old book. And, and we live in modern times and, and the culture is changing. You'll be ostracized. You'll be laughed. You'll be tempted. There is so much temptation nowadays to, and it's so accepted to do certain things. That you look like a prehistoric dinosaur if you don't do them. I remember when I married my wife, uh, uh, I was engaged to her. We're going to get married the day of the wedding. I, I took, was it you, Titus? I think I took Titus to get a haircut. Uh, it wasn't me for sure. <laughs> and, and, and we went to, to Delia's or whatever it was called. Uh, no, it wasn't Delia's, Lupita's. Huh? Marilu, yeah. She said, you look the same. I go, yeah, I still don't have hair. <laughs> And she said, oh, what is this occasion, happy occasion? I go, I'm getting married. And she goes, oh, how nice. So how long have you and your girlfriend been living together? I go, excuse me? She goes, yeah, how long? This is just assumed. People live together, and then maybe they get married. She goes, how long have you and your girlfriend been living together? I go, we haven't been living together, but we're about to start. She looked at me like I had just landed from Mars or another planet. You are a strange one. 
and people will laugh at you and they'll say that doesn't work today. Young people, I want to tell you, stand for your beliefs in Jesus Christ and your convictions and don't be intimidated and don't be ashamed. If people can brag about what they do that's evil and wicked, you brag about what you can do for God. And that's the time we're coming to. Without holiness, no man shall see God. Let me end with this scripture. 2 Peter 3, 11 through, and verse 14. Since all these things are about to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? And look at verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless, and holiness. Holiness isn't wearing long dresses. It isn't wearing suits and having a long face. Holiness simply means to be separated and consecrated for God. Where you say the culture may be this way, things may be this way, Christianity, the day is coming. I think the day is here already. It just hasn't, hasn't grown. Where Christianity is not that popular or respected anymore. You're looked at with suspicion. Maybe even called a terrorist. You speak about... Did you know that in Canada, if you speak on homosexuality, they will arrest you? And does this Equality Act passes? They might do the same thing for pastors here. Not arrest us, hopefully not, but fine us. Maybe lose our nonprofit status, threaten. Because in the new time that we're in, it's time to get rid of quote-unquote discrimination and hate. So you Christians got to get with it. I'm sorry, but I can't get with it because I'm already with it with somebody else, with the Bible and the Word of God. And I can't break away from this. If we don't ha preach the Bible, we might as well shut our mouths up and not say anything else the rest of our life because we don't have anything to say except what the Bible says. That's all. And I know the Bible makes some people comfortable, including myself. <laughs> you think it doesn't make me feel comfortable when the Bible says pray for those that persecute you and love your, bless your enemies, love your enemies? That's tough. I pray, yes, Lord, I pray for my enemies. Take them away, move them somewhere else, do something with them. Save them, transform them, change them. But I hardly pray, God, they're lost and they need you. They hurt me deeply. I'm not saying that you have to have a loving, intimate relationship with them. But don't let the devil use that to put anger, hatred, and bitterness in your heart. Now, as I conclude, I know. Sometimes we say as we conclude and we keep concluding. <laughs> let me say this. Because this is powerful. If God asks us to do those, this for those that intentionally persecute us. It's their mission to hurt us. And God tells us to do this for them. How much more for our brothers and our sisters in the Lord, for our family members? This would save so many problems and so many relationships if we learn to forgive as Jesus forgives. I'm the first one that I need to start there. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we live in a crazy world that's about to get crazier. Our faith will be tested. Our convictions will be tested. Our beliefs and values and everything we hold dear is about to be tested. God, we've lived in relative 
freedom and comfort and respect and honor and it, we've had a good God but now those things are changing and my concern is for believers the body of Christ how ready are we oh, how I need it's time to wake up from our sleep more than my words can say. the title of this part one while Jesus, you were sleeping Look what happened. Jesus, but we can wake up this morning. You that are watching me by online, you can wake up this morning. You can you can say, it, I, I've been too comfortable and now I'm going to get up and I, I'm going to ask God to just uh, uh, bring me back to that place of consecration and commitment and holiness to God and seriousness and following the Lord. Because let me tell you something. If COVID kept so many people away from church because they were afraid, I, mean, I don't want to go there, I'm going to get infected and they may, may die. If COVID kept so many, and I'm not making light of COVID, I'm not. I lost a cousin that's a pastor and I just lost a, a cousin of one of my cousins that's also a pastor to COVID. And you know people that have died of COVID. I'm not making light of it, I'm just making a point. We're so afraid to come to church because of COVID. Can you imagine when the government says, at any time we can come in and we can break it up and we can arrest you? Can you imagine the persecution ever gets to the point where people that are so stirred up to hate Christians would come in and start blasting away? That, that, that it got to the point where it could happen at any time and we knew it could happen. How many people would come to church? If COVID emptied us to the point that we were closed for eight weeks, and I know I had to do that, I'm not saying we shouldn't, but after eight weeks to try to get people back, I am so thankful for you that are here, for coming back. But man, if, if we don't have the courage to, to serve God now, when are we going to get it? I almost get tempted to go out there talk to the meanest, most insulting person just so they can give me a good insult so I can get stirred up. I've had it too easy. Go ahead and tell me off. Call me names. I need it. And the person that got slapped and said I needed that. Toughen us up, Lord. Speak to our hearts to that person that is watching online that wants a close walk with you but hasn't figured it out, Lord, there it is right there. If anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. We're going to talk about that next week a little bit more. Have your way, dear Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. You know, I'm going to do something different. I know I'm, I'm still trying to be respectful of everybody and I and I won't criticize you, I won't put you down, I won't look at you differently. But these altars are here for a reason. I'm to blame as your pastor because I've waited too long to because I confess to you that I've been a little afraid of myself. But this morning, starting today, these altars are open for anybody who wants to come. If it helps you any, Tito was here and he sprayed them all with Lysol real good. And it helps you. So they're Lysol and Holy Spirit. And if you want to come, say, God, help me answer the question. Am I ready? For it? It's already started. It's going to get even better. Would you do that? As I pray, make your way up here. If you feel you need to leave, feel free to leave. We fully understand. I do ask you to keep it a little quiet if you need to fellowship, do it toward the back in respect of those that are up here praying. Father, this morning, we open up these altars. It's about time, God, to come once again and kneel before you and say, God, you are my God. I will follow you no matter what it costs, Lord. It's time for me to prepare and to get serious and to be ready to face what may come, Lord, even in my life, God. 
in the name of Jesus. Speak to hearts right now as some people are already making their way and others are considering that Lord we would come to these altars and we would just kneel even if it's for a while and just cry out to you and say Lord I cry out to you for my country. I cry out to you for the church. I cry out to you for my family and my neighbors and my friends and Lord I even cry out to you for myself God because I may not be ready for what the challenges that are coming and I need to get serious and I need to get ready Father in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus God if we feel like we've been persecuted by our own family now it's nothing to what can come God we need to toughen up we need to get ready dear Lord Father begin with me dear God as the pastor of this church oh in the name of Jesus just have your way I pray be glorified dear God in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus if you want prayer I I'd be dead, happy to pray for you. You can come forward with people praying here and crying out to God. And, and be, I'd be honored to pray with you and anoint you with oil if you want that this morning. God bless you this morning. If you feel we need to really do it, respect you. Let me down in all my sorrow and pain. I will trade.